Okay. Um, so I'm just going to ask the, the opening question, um, which kind of binds the two films together. And of course, we've got Paul speaking on behalf of Conrad because you worked so long with him. The film took 20 years to make, right? Yeah, but I was only involved for the for, for eight. But you still years. were with Conrad for some of that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, he came. I used to be a member of a team that ran an art space in Northampton called the Fish Market, and um, and it was a weird and wonderful place. But it was huge, and it was cavernous. And if you put a regular band in there to play, it just sounded awful. And um, a friend of mine, uh, I used to be a tour manager back in the 90s in a f in with Chicago art bands, and, um, and somebody said, you, you should get Tony Conrad in here, and, and um, I had no idea who he was, and events came together, and he came and played. Which year is this? That was 2007, and uh, there was life before Tony and life after <laughs> meeting Tony. It was great. Great, so we've now... Um sort of vindicated you as the voice of Tony. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to ask a question. I think it's of John, really, um, but it's kind of rambling. I just want to pull some points from the film which were really poignant. So when uh, Tony looked into the camera and said, you're looking at videotapes, who's in charge? I'm in charge. Um, and also when he was sort of railing about eliminating the composer from the structure of the music that he felt he'd gone into with with uh, Lamont Young. So John, I thought you both share this concept of the studio of the streets, which is the title of Conrad's Vox Pop movies, or that TV show when he was on the street, um, playing on the idea of authority, relative reality, and the urban soundtrack. So I wanted to ask you about the soundtrack in your film. You don't just play with juxtaposition and inversion, you also play with the viewer's ideas of the present, taking the the cue, I suppose, from the quote of the film of Conrad's documentary, which was written, music is completely in the present. And in your film, you, the narrator, tell us, I am standing in a field. Um, can you speak, uh, and the visuals show, obviously, the, the uh, street and the sound is of the alarm bells and the street. Um, so can you speak about the dimensions created by this very singular soundtrack and comment on the prolonged use of the alarm sound in both of the locations of your film? Okay. Um, I mean, I hope the film sort of says <laughs> things for itself in a way. And, uh, but um, the, in terms of the... the um, well, let me just talk about the, the shot at the end of the film, because I, mean, I might go off the point a little bit, but the reason that that shot is there is um, largely um, in order to give the viewer a bit of thinking time without these um, hopefully humorous things going on uh, because I made that film at a time when there wasn't much humor in British artist film and I was kind of slightly concerned that people would just see, see the film as being a comedy you know and it's a very serious film about documentary and about the power of voiceover and these sorts of things um, but the the, the the sound of the alarm is simply it's just a switch between the two different you know between between the two different um, places. The most of my work is to do is there's a, an element of chance in it. So what I probably should say is I didn't want the alarm to be there. It was something that was actually ringing when I went to make the film. <laughs> so when I when when I turned up, you know, I made it film as a student. I had to book the uh, camera months and weeks in advance. Anyway, I turn up one afternoon to make the film, and there's this burglar alarm ringing, uh, and I thought, God, oh dear, I can't because the street sound is sync sound, and then I added the voiceover afterwards, of course. Um, so I thought, oh, I can't film with this sound going on, and then I waited and waited and waited. Um, unfortunately, a, f a queue started building up outside the cinema, which I wasn't anticipating, actually. And so, so that was very, very fortuitous. And in the end, I thought, oh, I've got to, I've, I've got to film, and I've got to um, record the sound. So, uh, because it is such an insistent element in the film, um, I thought I've got to refer to this. You know, so, but the, but that that accident, like other accidents, is one of the things that directs in a way, the things or um, to some extent determines things that happen in the film. So because I had a burglar alarm ringing, I thought, okay, I've got to make a reference to it. So that's why 
the boy who robbed the post office at the end of the film exists because there's a burglar alarm ringing. So, uh, so I, I, I really like how those things shape, shape a work. Uh, and when I made that film, it was when I, and maybe there's quite a strong connection with Tony Conrad here in terms of playing with chance. It was when I first realised that chance was like such a, uh, a, 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 a could be such a such a, a great element in in work. I mean, when I shot the film, uh, the first half, as you see, is, is only two shots, so the shot of the street, um, I was quite happy with when I got the footage back, except for this one point where, uh, where the camera zooms in on the clock for the first time, and, I, and there's this really jerky zoom. And I thought, oh God, I'm going to have to watch. You know, I, uh, I'm sort of quite technically fussy about this sort of thing, so I thought, this is really going to annoy me having to look at this zoom all the time so and they said ah i can direct it so i ask if you remember in the film i say um, now i want the clock to move jerkily towards me and as you see it does it absolutely perfectly so i i, I realized that you know one can turn things in other directions probably haven't answered your question no, you at have. All. I, mean, I think <laughs> i think the element of indeterminacy is is resonating with this idea of giving up authorship while you're also imitating authorship mm. and authority. So, yeah, 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 it's all about lack. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's, the, it's the tension between control and lack of control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Firstly, thank you to Fari for the opportunity. And uh, also, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to meet you both. Uh, OK, so to ensure the well-being of creatives, what are the steps that need to be taken by educational institutions or workplaces, especially those who produce unconventional work? That's definitely a Paul Williams question. Do you want to repeat it just again? <laughs> sure. To ensure the well-being of creatives, what are the steps that need to be taken by educational institutions or workplaces, especially those who produce unconventional work? <sighs> unlock the doors in the morning I suppose of the universities and let people in um, employ good teachers <laughs> um, the, and, but it just came to mind as you said about the workplace mm -hmm. one of my favourite um, movements or my um, art movements in the UK over the past kind of 50 years was the artist placement group um, John Latham I think it was wasn't it that you, they used to um, companies used to open up and have a kind of an artist in residence inside the business, which I, I'm astounded that it doesn't happen, you know, it's not a regular kind of occurrence, really, that every business, is, I mean, it should be a kind of a, a, a part of the incorporation of a, any business that you have to have an artist, you know. Um, be quite funny with me being a one person working out of the bedroom if an artist came around every morning and wanted to interact with me, but anyway. Um, but yeah, I think it's th those ideas, um, you know, schools really, you know, maybe primary schools, secondary schools, you know, should have should have a, a artists working working in there, um, which would generate a kind of a, a I guess a natural daily occurrence for for the for the public to have art in you know within the everyday, you know, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that. But but university. I mean, I didn't go go to university. Um, I went and uh, went and drove rock and roll bands around Europe, which was my kind of um, kind of an autodidact way of of learning, as Tony would say, how not to do things. Um, yeah, if that answers your question. That did actually. Thank you. Um, okay, for both of you, if both films were to be made today, what kind of differences do you think would be visible? Considering the technological boom, I know that your film's a lot more recent, but if you have to look at Girl Chewing Gum, mm -hmm. what would you both do differently? Well, I actually remade the Girl Chewing Gum in 2011, 35 years after the original version. I made a, I made a video piece called The Man Phoning Mum. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did was that I um, took the original film on my iPhone and strapped it next to the viewfinder, LCD viewfinder of my high definition color video camera and attempted to follow the movements of the original film. Uh, and in the final, in the, in the end result, I superimposed 
1976 and 2011 together, which uh, had a very eerie effect um, because you get these, you know, these very grainy black and white people from 1976 passing by with uh, with the very brightly coloured high definition people from 2011. Mm. But there were many things that it made me think about. I mean, I originally decided I did it as a conceptual piece, uh, but partly also because of uh, the film is shot in Dalston, where I still live, and you know that area of, of East London has become incredibly gentrified. So it's very, very different from how it was then. And I think you know we see how how basic how you can see clearly how poor a lot of the people are who are walking down the street. Not that very poor people don't exist now, but in terms of the the ratio of the demographic, it's very different. Um, but um, the, 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 the there were just various things that I that I recognised that I hadn't really thought about. Not least about how people actually behave in the street. And I got rather depressed, actually, <laughs> because literally one of the reasons it's called the man phoning mum is every second person is on a mobile phone or they've got earphones in their ear. So the sense of people actually kind of engaging with the environment around them is much less than in uh, than in the girl chewing gum. So you really feel as though that... that, um, that that uh, our behaviour has kind of fundamentally changed. You know? and so that's, that's one of many things. Uh, that's so interesting, because in Women in Prison, Tony Conrad's unfinished film, he had put this time change and this uh, media change from old-style film to modern film mm. in a time capsule where technology doesn't really play a part. So it's so uh, opposites of what John just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, it was a shame that that... I mean, I mean terribly sad when Mike Mike Kelly killed himself really and that that I mean for a number of reasons not just that the film then Tony then just decided that he couldn't continue on with that project because I think that it would have been quite an astounding piece of work but Tony was a kind of a master of the unfinished work I mean he 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 would have been engage himself completely in an idea and if he got to a point where he thought nah actually that's 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 crap and I don't well, he just can finish, you know. Andrew Lampert, um, who's a, 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 the archivist in the movie, is because uh, Tony passed away about two weeks after we we finished the film, um, which was which was heartbreaking in a number of ways. But Andy then had to go into I think three different locations where Tony had kind of kept his work. And, and had this extremely difficult task of find, thinking, OK, well, you know, he'd kind of find a box and inside there'd be some, you know, there'd be restaurant receipts and, and, and things or, you know, shopping lists and things. And he'd, he'd go, is this just a shopping list or is this a work? You know, right, we'll put that on the don't know column, you know. <laughs> you know, scraps of paper with a, with a, with a, with, 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 some kind of um, uh, um, sums on it, or you know, arithmetic, or whatever it was. You know, is that a work? Is this something important? And 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 um, the and they're still doing it. I mean, three years later, I think. But but I think that with Tony, um, I mean, with the film itself, I mean, because Tyler, the the shots of of the Faust concert in '94 in New York was the first shoot for the film. I mean, it wasn't supposed. He he didn't think he was going to make a documentary about Tony. He just went because Jeff Hunt, Table of the Elements, Jeff used to live in, in you know, they used to share a, a, an apartment together in San Francisco. And um, and so Tyler became, you know, the de default videographer for Table of the Elements, which was an incredible group of, of, of people. And so went to shoot this concert. And then had a there's we have an interview you know the interviews didn't make make the film but we had, t Tyler then did an interview with Tony and you could you you know Tyler just said he'd never met him before he didn't really know anything about him but he he went to have a ten minute um, interview with Tony and it went on for two and a half hours <laughs> you know Tony could talk and you know and he realised then wait a minute here there's something there's something going going on with this guy and then and then we'd just keep shooting. The concerts, the festivals, and things, and and then he'd edit up 
whatever he shot, he'd then edit down into you know it's it's perfect you know um, Take. t t takes takes and then and after a few years he realised you know God, I've got all of these these wonderful kind of vignettes and then just kept shooting and then when when Tyler and I met after my experience with Tony, you know we had. I mean, we had no plans to ever finish the film. I mean, because we just wanted the excuse to be around Tony, you know, and thought actually a film about Tony, Tony's not going to want a film about himself. And um, but that, so Tyler started it on video, I think, and then it went to high eight, and then it went to to digital. So he had all these different formats, um, and of course, and then Tony's own, you know, then there was Super Eight to go through. There was six, sixteen. There was thirty-five millimeter stuff, you know, for the archive. And, and you've got loads of great graphics and um, photo. Yeah, well, the the, the the New York flipped on its side. We decided that we'd make a kind of a, what would it be like to make a music video of a Tony Conrad piece, and that's twelve. I think twelve minutes long. That, and we showed it um, at a well. Anybody can have it you know with the, the, a lot of music festivals sometimes just set up a room and just show that on loop mm -hmm. and people just love it you know just stay in there for hours it's really kind of it's a, it's a wonderful piece so yeah okay so uh, what responsibility do creatives have when it comes to film and broadcast while producing work that is socially responsive whilst keeping future societies in mind do we, are you asking about now versus the future? Yeah. Just repeat it again. What responsibility do creatives have when it comes to film and broadcast while producing work that is socially responsive whilst keeping future societies in mind? Ooh. I think I'd answer that question very, very simply. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm not used to hearing kind of questions in, phrased in sort of... I mean, I, I should be, because I spent most of my life in academia, but I don't <laughs> very often hear, uh, talk about my own work in, in, in academic terms, really. But, uh, but I, uh, the simple answer is that one, you know, uh, you know, for me personally, and I hope other people, you make work which is, relates to things that you care about and the things that you feel are important in the world mm. and that you hope are going to actually form some communication with other people. Um, just as simple. Sorry, just as simple as that. I don't know. Is that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, and I suppose as a film a documentary producer, I I feel a great weight of responsibility to 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 myself mostly to kind of not waste time on things that aren't worth telling. I mean, I think it's funny that every band now has a documentary, whether they've they've made anything that's worthwhile listening to. Um, <laughs> in the first instance, they've got a documentary, you know, because it's now everybody, you know, digital technology makes it so it doesn't cost much money actually to make a film. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, as John and I were talking about another film that I made um, about the folk singer Shirley Collins, I mean, and that was an interesting thing because if when we had the idea of making a film about about an artist that lost their voice and therefore the thing that defined them. That's why we wanted to t tell that story. Actually, as we made the film, she decided that she'd get her voice back, you know, and actually approach singing again. And, um, and for me, I didn't even care about finishing that film because the process of actually starting a film and the power of the camera on a subject had changed, you know, had, had kind of changed her life you know, for the positive, and I thought, well, that's enough, really. What's the point of actually, fin you know, breaking, breaking, you know, your, your heart in many ways, because it's, it's difficult raising money for films, and especially when people then say, well, it's not worth telling, and you feel that it is. I think that's a, that's a tough one to deal with a lot of the time. So I think you're both saying the personal is already political and the now is relating already to the future. So just by focusing on the personal and the now, you're already thinking about the future in some way because it's your message to the yeah. future, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, how I, that's certainly how I feel. Mm. I'm, I'm very aware that if there are pressing political issues in the, work, my, in the, in the, in the world at the moment, at a particular time, my work becomes more overtly political. If, thing, if I'm feeling... <laughs> <laughs> so things are not so worrying. <laughs> Step back a little bit, mm. but 
But, uh, but the problem, and coming back to you talking about broadcast, of course, is that many people make work as a kind of employee of a broadcasting institution mm -hmm. and are given a subject to make work about. Uh, for myself, I'll never make a piece of work about anything that doesn't relate in some way to my own experience. Mm -hmm. So every work I make, most of it is to do with my own, is set in my own immediate environment. I mean, that was the end of my street, that film there. I haven't moved very far since then, <laughs> apart from a few films made in other countries, but, t but they always come out of like being in a hotel somewhere and something happening or something like that. I don't, you know, sort of research a subject and then yeah. go somewhere and think, oh, it'd be interesting to make a film about that. It's always something happens and then the work that's the trigger to actually initiate a new piece of work. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think we've got 10 minutes left uh, for the audience. Uh, so probably two or three pertinent, short, nice questions without too much of a long statement. Hello. Testing. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed both films. Thanks for showing them. Um, just wondering if Tony left any specific instructions about the archive that he left behind and who is in charge of the archive, what plans do they have, and yeah, how is it funded even, I wonder? Yeah, um, the estate, Tony's estate is, is um, overseen by Tony Owsler who was a great friend of, of, you know, they were long time friends. Um, when, when Tony first passed away, I mean, like most, most um, estates and things, especially Tony's, which was all just all over the place, you know, it was, there was, there was kind of a bit of infighting going on, but, um, which was a bit disappointing for a number of reasons in, in for a number of ways. But yeah, Tony oversees it now. To um, Conrad, had, he, he'd left, a certain sum of money and um, very key, you know, strict instructions that this money was for for um, a space where it could be, um, the work could be kept safely. Because, um, I mean, up until I think about a year before he passed, um, he didn't give a crap about it. <laughs> you know, it was just everywhere. And then I think there was, a, you know, and Andy, Lampert told me there was this moment, it was just like, you know, he just received a call one day and he said, right, I now have to take this seriously. Because, he, you know, he had cancer, so he knew he was, you know, he had, he had only a certain amount of time left, yeah. Um, but, and there's a new, and the results of all of that work, um, there's a retrospective going around America now. I think it started in Buffalo last year. There's a book, um, and Tony's book about the, History of music, I think, is I think it's been published now. It's a mighty tome, you know, where he explores the um, his hatred and respect for um, uh, um, Pythagoras, and then because then he's got his other there. There are the other element uh, characters in history. Rameau is one. The, the composer Rameau. He's got the roughing up Rameau is one of his pieces. Um, yeah, because again, it, it's about all that that power and authority, you know. Because Rameau was the what was he the court composer for Louis the Fifteenth or Sixteenth, and using music as a military command structure, you know, was something that you know Tony really wanted to explore as a kind of a this is how we've got to where we are today, you know. And here's the history. Yeah, I, many you know an hour was spent being told about that project, you know. Thank so, you. Yeah. Any more questions? Come on, be brave. Um, hello. This is a very short question, and um, you might not be able to answer. But in his, uh, in Comrade's Women in Prison, why didn't he use women? Was it he wanted to use specifically those artists? or Yeah, just, I don't know whether you'll be able to answer that. Uh, as far as I understand it, he was just, yeah, he was playing with gender roles. I think you know, where the guards were women dressed as men, yeah. and then the, poli the the prisoners were men dressed as women. Yeah, I think that that was what he was doing was playing with those roles. I'll go look it up after this. <laughs> I, I didn't sort even of notice that. Sort back to Jack Smith's Flaming Creatures, doesn't it? And uh, I don't know what that sort of thing is anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To do with the origin of that. Thanks anyway. Um, yeah, thank you for um, the lecture. Um, 
did uh, John Conrad talk about his inspirations or the people, the artists that inspired him? Uh, I think in that, uh, I know what his favourite type of music was, was Hawaiian um, dance music, you know, yeah, with ukuleles. That was his favourite music. <laughs> it's the only kind of music he thought that had any value, I think. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I th um, yeah, his inspiration. I don't, I don't really know who he. I think he was, he was, um, he was unique. I think, I think that that experience of working with um, in the Dream Syndicate. Um, was was fundamental to the rest of his um, work because again, in there, you know, and it was like, and the Cage, John Cage, that's the answer. Okay. Got there in the end. <laughs> what about you, John? <laughs> what, what would be your answer to that question for your influences? My own influences. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I just I just answered that indirectly in relation to it's quite. I was just thinking actually watching the film that. Um, You'd asked me, and you'd mentioned as well, I think, so do you think Tony Conrad saw Girl Chewing Gum? Um, and I can't answer that question. I can imagine it's quite likely, given, mm. that he, that given that he taught film at American University. But what I was thinking, which was interesting to me, was that one of the first avant-garde films I ever saw was Tony Conrad's, and Tony and Beverly Conrad's Straight and Narrow, nice. which was... Uh, and the first film I ever made is a film of black and white lines, cut to, wait for it, White Light, White Heat by the Velvet Underground. Oh, my God, <laughs> serendipity. I made no That's connection brilliant. between Tony Conrad and Velvet Underground, but I'm sure that seeing that, that, that straight and narrow, which is a piece of you know, cut to music, actually was kind of quite influential on me. It's, it's, you know, I think the music for Straight and Narrow is John Cale and... Philip Glass, I think. Is it really? I think, well, right. Not maybe not know. Philip Glass or one right. of the other one of the other guys. Yeah. Right. I, rem I remember at the time, you know, being a sort of young hippie. I didn't like the music at all. It was much, sounding much too kind of mainstream and conventional. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, it's in the credits, I think. I'll have to have a think. About <laughs> There's it. got a question in the back. I love okay. that. Thanks to you both. I really enjoyed. Well, to all, all of you, really enjoyed those films. Um, you both said you got a lot out of making the films. What's your favourite thing for each of you that you learned from making each of the films? Uh, for me, it was, with, with my film, it was to do with discovery of the power of the voiceover to actually determine how you look at images. So when I, when I made the film, obviously, it, it, I was expecting that it would have the effect that it does, but um, I was surprised how effective it was and the fact that you know sometimes you look at you you can't help but sort of half believe in things sometimes so uh that's why you know sort of the um at the end of the film i say i can i guess you know when it gets very absurd and i say you know, in the distance in the in the field i can see a man with a helicopter in his pocket you know, walking <laughs> his dog and, and what i i think most because the power of language is so strong that you don't, Im even though you know you're being really messed around by the film, you don't immediately dismiss it. You try and rationalise it. Think, Helic how can you have a helicopter in your pocket? Is it a toy helicopter? You know. So, so that was a really big discovery for me, and I, I've used voiceover in many of my uh, later films to actually uh, basically subvert the way in which we look at images, documentary images of the real world. Um. I guess the thing that I got out got out most of it was was finding that I, I like being a I like making documentaries. I mean, I kind of came into it by mistake, really. And um, but the research that I was allowed to do within the project of you know Tyler had made many 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 interviews with some really wonderful people about you know talking about Tony and and so I transcribed all of those um, those those interviews and I just learned an immense amount of stuff you know which made me a better person I guess you know and that's and, it, and then it it's it's demanding of me now that I that, that, that the stories that 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 you commit to because that these things take a long time I mean no, nobody would t you know takes 22 years I mean it's 
ridiculous, but it, but, but it's the right thing to have done for Tony because, as he says, he likes long durations of time. I mean, you couldn't make a film about Tony that would be as good as that, you know. So, in, in any, in any kind of different length of time, but it's, yeah, it's that research, you know. I mean, I've just started, we just started a project about Mark Fisher, the the philosopher and, and cultural theorist, and it's immense, you know, and it's like, how the hell are you going to make this good? But it's important, you know, and, and it's required, and it's and it goes back to the question about responsibility around, you know, uh, and, and for future audiences, you know, that his story needs to be told because it's, it's and it's the time to do it. Um, so we'll see, watch this space. <laughs> Probably a six-year project, I'm thinking that's going to be, but who knows, you know, because there won't be any money. You know, people aren't going to be running towards us. Oh, you're, gonna, you're the ones that are going to make Mark, tell Mark Fisher's story. <laughs> Great, here's loads of money. Well, didn't he teach at Goldsmiths? He did, yeah. So maybe there's some there. Yeah, about £4.50, I'm reckoning, <laughs> but anyway. But, you know, but just one thing before I do forget, um, that if, if you can tell... If you enjoyed the Tony film and you want to see it again, or you have people that you want to to to, to um, advise to go and see it, is I've I've got a screening of it at Cafe Otto on the tenth of November, Sunday. I think it's a Sunday afternoon, so <laughs> matinee. Um, and Jennifer Walsh, who who was great friend of Tony's and collaborate La, Tony's kind of final collaborator, is going to be there, and she's going to play some. Recordings nobody's ever heard that they made just before Tony passed away, and then we'll show the film and have have a bit of a hoopla. So, yeah, please. She's the one who says um, he told me to pretend to write and ask that question is wait yeah. for an answer. Yeah, I'm going to try that. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Can I ask one then? Uh, just very personal to me is that um, I felt as a young man, um, definitely you were. John, um, sort of diametrically opposed to the mainstream, and you were trying to deconstruct it, not just through your film, but also, I think, through your your personal style, your narrative was very. Uh, it felt very sort of, um, should we say, guerrilla in a way, maybe. And uh, and and those quotes from Conrad when he says um, when he was playing the one chord pop song on tour, he said, "I felt like an imposter, but also more real at the same time." And then he asked himself, um, "Maybe I can be more socially constructive and get into community TV." Um, so these ideas of being um, sort of independent of the economy and resisting professionalisation, I felt resonated with your career mm. also. You know, I've seen Black Tower. Mm. I saw it at the BFI. Oh, what a fantastic film. Yeah, Black Tower by John Smith. You have to see it, um, and you can find it online, unfortunately. But I just wanted to say um, how much then for attention for Conrad and for you, John, was it to become successful and still be the person that you originally were? Well, that's a difficult question, really. I mean, I'm not that successful. I've spent all my... <laughs> spent, I, you know, I've recently retired from teaching, but I taught part-time in an art school to survive. So it depends what you mind, mean, depends what you mean by successful. I mean, I am, I'm aware that, you know, some of my work is pretty well known now. Uh, but I have to say, quite often I bump into people and say, and they say, oh, you, you're the guy who made The Girl Chewing Gum. I say, yeah, that's right. I say, well, are you still making films? I think, well, I've made about 50 since then, but that <laughs> happens to be probably my best known one. Um, I mean, do you get approached to do some really horrible mainstream projects? No. Uh. no nobody approaches <laughs> me to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have occasion. I, 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 when, when I... When I first left college I did make one or two pieces that were that I otherwise wouldn't have made I made a rather you know, uh, eccentric um, half hour promo film for the band Echo and the Bunnymen I don't know if you know of them in 1980 and that was uh, that was rather different from what I've done that I would have done otherwise but at the same time it was a bit like one of my films with these people popping up in it every now and then and uh, eventually playing some music but um, I don't know. It's getting it's it's getting the balance of things right, isn't it? I mean, for me, I've just always wanted to make work which is accessible and that people are going to see. I'm not one of those people who say, "Oh, I'd be perfectly happy to sit in a garret, you know, kind of making work that people don't see." I wouldn't make work if I didn't think people were going to see it. Um, and I'm interested in making work which. Um, 
a general audience would likely is likely to get something from if they're as long as they're a bit open minded. I'm not making. I don't want to make work which is for you know for for elites or people people who have actually have to understand references in order to understand the work. Um, so I I really enjoy it when my work gets out into the public arena more. Although I have to say, when you show things on television, you don't really. It's a bit of an anticlimax because you don't get anybody asking you about it or <laughs> responding to it in any way. You get your paycheck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I could just do, I just very quickly tell a very short story that I kind of quite like to tell. That um, I made a series of videos called Hotel Diaries, which were um, not not my uh, easiest work in some ways, and they they added up to a ninety six minute long series. And uh, so what the Somebody I knew at the Picture House Cinemas uh, decided that they were going to uh, persuade um, other other uh, directors of Picture House Cinemas to show these films for a short run. Uh, and to cut long story short, they showed to kind of empty houses around the country for about a week or two weeks. Uh, it took me a long time to get the statistics, the, get the figures off of the people who organised it, but it was literally, you know, empty cinema or one person or two people. Uh, but I did Q and A's at some of these screenings, and I did one at the Tyneside Cinema in Newcastle. And I turned up there, and the, the cinema was like a multiplex cinema. But it was my work was showing quite a big cinema in the multiplex, and uh, and I was really pleased when I went into the theatre. I thought this theatre is, is completely full, and it was, and it was I thought oh it's sold out in Newcastle. What's you know I don't really understand why I've got so many people here. So I showed the film. Everybody seemed attentive. And at the end, I did a and a and the first person put the hand up, and they said, um, "Well, I don't want to ask. I, I, I don't want to ask questions. I'd like to say that um, I came here to see Batman Three, uh, <laughs> but it was sold out, and so I had to get. This was the only thing I could get into, so I came in, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much." <laughs> so I then said to the audience, "So, how many people came to see Batman Three? <laughs> Ninety-five uh, percent of the audience put their hands up, and they'd all come. Literally, at least ninety-five percent. I didn't really see many hands that didn't go up. Uh, they'd come to see Batman Three, but we had a great um, Q and A. People stayed for about three quarters of an hour. <laughs> Nobody left, and it gave me the confidence that actually, once you get you, once you get people in a room, you know, people are open to seeing different kinds of work. You know. The problem is actually getting them in there. <laughs> we had um, we did a screening of the Tony film um, at Soho House in Barcelona. I met this, the programmer there, and he he did it as a as a secret cinema that kind of thing. It was you know nobody he invited everybody all his friends to come. They didn't know what film it was they were going to see, and it and it worked mm -hmm. really really well. And I kind of proposed that that's what they should do all the time, and they just thought you know, just to expose people to to different types of cinema and different types of stories that they just wouldn't choose to to do. But they decided that was a bit too radical. There's actually, a, <laughs> at the uh, at the NFT, there's a monthly event where um, a guy who, uh, called Will Fowler, who, oh, yeah. who, who, who programs experimental film there, does a thing called a, um, uh, Experiment and Mixtape where he shows a selection of work that people don't know what's going to be yeah, seen. Yeah, a great idea. And they don't even... They get program notes at the end of the screening to find out what it was that they actually saw if it didn't have a title. So, uh, that's funny. That's quite a nice idea. Just a quick one, just a bit of program notes. Tony, being a teacher, used to give people a, the, reading, the, the reading list for the course at the end of the course. Because his, his, his justification with that was, well, I have no idea who you are and what you, you should be reading at the beginning of the course. It's going to take me the length of the course to get to know you. And to, I think that's very clever. <laughs> as long as there's not an exam on it, it quits soon after. Yeah. Well, Tony used to, there's a wonderful piece that Tony made called, um, uh, what was it, G Homework Guidance for Teachers. And it's and it's basically how he used to grade papers. You get the paper and bounce a ball on it. And if it bounced three times, that was a C. <laughs> yeah, so good luck with all of that, students. <laughs> all right. Well, I think on that note, um, we should thank our guests and our um, co-host here, for, and Annie, our, the visiting practitioner. Yes. Thank as, you very much. Yes. Yeah, so, a round of applause for them. Thank you to...
Safari for doing this. Um, this has been a labour of love. Well, to thank me, could you just do me a favour? Could you put your hand up if you're not from LCC? Because I went round. Uh, where are you from? LCC. Yay. And uh, anyone else? Where are you from? Which? Where are you from? A college? Yeah, LCF. LCF. Okay. And you? How did you hear about it? Uh, an email. Was it the postgrad email? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, RCA. RCA. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.